Good morning. And happy Mother's Day. You know, God commands us to honor our fathers and our mothers that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. It's the first commandment that actually has a promise attached to it. It's a special commandment. And Scripture also commends the teaching of mothers and fathers. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 20 and 22. My son, keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. And when you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk with you. Today we give thanks for the gift of mothers and we pray for God's continued blessings and guidance for all mothers. If you're new here, welcome. We're delighted to have you with us and we pray that your faith would be built up and strengthened through our time together in the Word. And if you don't have a church home in Northwest Arkansas, we invite you to consider making Holy Trinity your church home. If you're interested in that, talk with me or talk with one of our elders and we'll be happy to get you plugged into that process. We do ask that everyone please fill out the little connection card that you'll find in the pew in front of you. Give us some information to let us know that you're here today. If you're a member, it helps me to serve you better. And if you're a guest, it gives me an opportunity to reach out and share some of what's going on here at Holy Trinity. I promise, if you give me your contact information, I will not spam you. Um, our service today is the service of prayer and preaching. You can find that in your uh, hymnals on page 260. It's also in the bulletin and on the screen up front. We begin with the opening hymn, number 605, Father Welcome. service of prayer and preaching, we rise. This is the day which the Lord has made. 
Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We continue with the Old Testament canticle. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. With joy will you draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord, call upon His name, make no among the peoples, proclaim that his name is exalted. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitants of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become salvation. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be You may be seated for our readings. Today is Good Shepherd Sunday because our readings point us to Jesus Christ who is our Good Shepherd. Our first reading from Acts chapter 20, Paul sends to Ephesus, he calls together the pastors and he talks to them about the work that he has done and the work that they have in front of them in pastoring the church and shepherding and serving as under shepherds in the church. Then we jump forward in our epistle reading through Revelation chapter 7, and you get this vision of heaven and the final outcome of all of this shepherding, uh, this great multitude that no one could number who stands before the throne and has been saved by Jesus Christ. And finally, the gospel reading from John chapter 10, uh, Jews have gathered around Jesus and asked, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And his point is hard but true, his sheep know his voice, and they already follow him. So if they haven't figured it out yet, they must not be among his sheep. Sabrina. The first reading for the fourth Sunday of Easter is from Acts chapter 20. Now from Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia. That happened to me through the plots of Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, 
testifying both to Jews and to the Greeks of repentance through God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, you will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease right, I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend to you God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up, and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, now himself, he, he, how him, he, excuse me, how he himself said, is more blessed to give than to receive. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> the epistles from the Revelation to St. John, chapter 7. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen! Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and they have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise out of awe and respect for the reading of the Holy Gospel, which is recorded in the 10th chapter of John. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. 
Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Having heard the word of God, it is appropriate that we profess our Christian faith. We do so in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. I invite the younger members of the congregation to come forward for a special message for them. Hey, Lucy. It might just be you and me, Lucy. Is that okay? Okay, good. Because I got a game for us to play. Do you like to play a game? Okay. Well, sit down and we'll talk about it for a second. Okay, so this is supposed to be a rope, but I couldn't find a rope, so it, it, it'll do. It'll do, right? Have you ever played um, tug-of-war? You know how that works? So with tug-of-war, you have a rope or an extension cord, and, and you get on either side of a line, and you try and pull real hard to pull the person who's pulling on the other side of the rope across the line. Does that make sense? Yeah. You want to have a game of tug-of-war? That would be fun, wouldn't it? Let's play tug-of-war. This is going to be good, huh? Now, let's see here. I've got to unwrap this thing a little bit so we've got something to pull on. This, what? Yeah, okay, good. So you take, you take this side of the rope, okay? Stand right over there. Go right, yeah, back up just a little bit because we've got to have some space to work, you know? Okay, I'm going to put this behind me. You, you might want, some people like to, you know, they like to hook it around their back. They anchor it, but I'm not going to do that. I won't, that's not fair. That's not fair. We need a fair fight here. Okay, so here's the deal. We've got to pull against each other, okay? and see which one of us can pull the other one across that line. Okay? You ready? You, who's, you think, who's going to win? Uh, it's going to be a good... It, <laughs> this is going to be good. Okay, are you ready? Pull real hard. Pull, pull. Come on, pull. You got to pull. Okay, oh, you're doing... Oh, that's good. All right, yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. I won! Yay! I won! No, come back, Lucy. There's more. <laughs> Lucy, come back. There's more. <laughs> hey, Lucy. 
Did you, was, did, did you think you might win? Was there any chance? Probably not. Because look, come here. You stand right here. Look, who was going to win that fight? Okay, come on up here and sit down. I won! Yay! All right, but now that wasn't fair, was it? I'm a lot bigger than you, right? And there was no, I mean, I think, I think. I have to be like, you are, that's true, and you're strong. But, like, I mean, look at us. Who was going to win that? Right? Well, I like that you're not sure. So, have a seat. So, here's the thing. In that gospel reading, that I'm never going to get up from here. <laughs> In that gospel reading that we just heard, Jesus was talking about how those who know him and who trust him, he's got a hold of them in his hand, and nobody can snatch them out of his hand. Now, Jesus is God, right? Who, who do you think would want to snatch someone out of Jesus' hand? No one, except for one person, one fallen angel. Satan, right? The devil. He's all the time trying to snatch people out of God's hand. It, the Bible says that Satan wanders around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So he's always trying to snatch them out of Jesus' hand. But it's a little like our game of tug of war. Because you pretty much know if God's on the other side of it, he's going to win, right? What is that? Strawberries. Strawberries. Yum. Okay, pull that down. Okay, good. So... That's the thing, is that God has got a hold of you and me and everybody, and he's never going to let us go. And that's a really comforting thought, to know that God is in charge, and nobody can beat God, and he's going to keep us safe, and he's going to make sure that we are with him forever. Isn't that comforting? Right. It's like a big game of tug of war, but we know who's going to win, don't we? Yeah. All right, well, let's say a prayer, okay? You know, fold your hands, pray after me. You guys can pray too, because, you know, it's just the two of us. Dear God, thank you for grabbing a hold of me and never letting me go. Because we know that you win. And we know that you bring us with you. We love you, Jesus. And we pray in your name. Amen. Okay, now you can go back to your seat. Thank you. That was fun. As she goes back to our seat, we continue with our hymn.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Sheep are stupid. You know that, right? I mean, you've heard it plenty of times. I know I have. They're flock animals, completely unable to think for themselves. And there are stories floating around about sheep following each other en masse off a cliff like lemmings. They might just be the stupidest animals on the planet. They're prone to wander. They can't fend for themselves. They desperately need a shepherd to protect them and watch out for them. Now I have to admit, I don't know a darn thing about sheep. I mean, I grew up in a college town. My dad was a drama professor. And, true story, I lived in a neighborhood called Green Acres, but despite the name, they were exactly zero sheep wandering around. I've never lived on a farm with sheep. I don't think I've ever even met a sheep. Sheep? Sheep. So, <laughs> it's probably not fair for me to cast judgment on their IQ, or to cast any doubt on their innate levels of wisdom. And of course, on a Sunday like this, Good Shepherd Sunday, it's tempting to trot out a bunch of shepherd and sheep metaphors and to use that to draw some conclusions about how life plays out in the church and our relationships with one another and with the world. But there are two challenges to this approach. First off, I'm not real comfortable using a metaphor that suggests that you people are stupid. Because I know you're not. And if the sheep part of the metaphor breaks down, well, I'm a little concerned maybe you won't be all that interested in the shepherd part of the metaphor either. I mean, if you can't identify with a sheep, how in the world are you going to find any comfort in the notion of Jesus Christ as your shepherd? Secondly, apparently sheep aren't that stupid after all. And if I'm uncomfortable suggesting that you're stupid, well, I'm even more uncomfortable with the notion of lying to you. I mean, they never really said it at the seminary, but even I know that lying to the congregation is not going to win me any credibility points. Neither is it going to endear me to you, nor will it make you very interested in hearing what I have to say. So I just won't go there, okay? See, what I've learned in my extensive research on the subject, which involved about five minutes of Googling, I actually Googled the phrase, sheep are stupid, <laughs> is that apparently sheep are in a lot of ways kind of like you. 
Abigail Gear, she's the president and co-founder of a place called the Mino Valley Farm Sanctuary, and also the caretaker of a bunch of rescued sheep, among other animals. She took the time in an online article to explain some more about sheep, and she says that sheep are exceptionally intelligent animals with unique personalities and a whole host of adorable and endearing qualities. See? A lot like you. Apparently, sheep are independent. They can get jealous of one another. They love to cuddle. They will come running when you call their name. They remember people. They love to sunbathe. They tend to be pretty well tuned in when somebody is up to something. Like some of you. Unfortunately, they can also carry emotional baggage. They grieve for their loved ones. They sometimes self-medicate. I guess we can identify with some of those attributes, too. Sheep tend to do best when they have a shepherd to watch over them and to care for them and to cover their needs. Yet another way that we individually are like sheep and as a congregation are like a flock. So maybe it's okay to use that sheep and shepherd metaphor after all. As I mentioned, this is Good Shepherd Sunday, and our readings from Scripture ultimately enlighten us about Jesus' role by casting him as the Good Shepherd. The Gospel reading from John chapter 10 especially highlights the idea that Christ is a shepherd and his followers are his flock, those who have heard his voice. And if you back up a little bit before our reading to the verses that lead up to it, Jesus actually says the words, I am the good shepherd. It's John chapter 10, verse 11. And our readings and the order that they're given to us suggest a particular way to approach this topic. In the first reading from Acts, we've got a picture of a good shepherd, Paul, who calls together the leaders in Ephesus and he gives a recap of the ministry among them, to which Jesus called him. And he paints a picture of a devoted and thoughtful pastor. And for me personally, it gives me kind of a benchmark of things to aim for. The second reading from Revelation shifts the focus from the image of a shepherd to the flock itself. It brings us to the end of time where we see the fruits of the church's work, a great multitude who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb and made them white. That is to say, a huge crowd of people who believed in Jesus Christ and have therefore received the gift of eternal life in the new heaven and the new earth. And then, having examined the work of the pastor and the work of the church, having looked at the fruits of those labors, the gospel reading brings it all back around to the central focus of everything, Jesus Christ. Because here we see not just a good shepherd, we see the good shepherd. We see the one in whom we place our trust. This is the power of the church. This is the cause for everything good that happens. Because in the end, the fruits of our labor, that great crowd around the throne of God, is not due to my work as the pastor, nor are they so much about our work as the church body. I mean, certainly, God uses us as instruments to accomplish these things, but everything that happens in and through the church is a result of God's loving care and provision, which is most clearly shown through the gift of salvation that we have in the suffering and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's God, the Holy Spirit, who calls us to faith, who invites us to become followers of Jesus Christ and to listen to what he has to say. And that may have happened for you when you were a tiny little baby at the waters of holy baptism. In fact, at our late service today, that will happen for Dawson Reimers as he is baptized and brought into the church. Or maybe God used some other Christian to share the gospel with you and to bring you to faith. There's a story of a young attorney who was always seeking, seeking. 
And he would pick up and read just about anything that he could find that promised a connection with God. And he didn't care what the source was. Jehovah's Witness tracts, writings by the Latter-day Saints, Buddhist prescriptions, Hindu, New Age, spiritualism, the secret, whatever. And then, rather surprisingly, he bought a copy of the Book of Concord, the Lutheran Confessions. I was looking to see if I had a copy here, but I don't. And this is a book that's about this thick. It's all of the writings of the church fathers that are the doctrine and the teaching of the Lutheran church. Now, most people would not read the Book of Concord. Seminary students do, of course, but it's densely packed, and it contains more than its fair share of church jargon. But this guy was an attorney, and he wasn't put off by some complicated language. So he read the whole thing with a Bible open right next to it. And suddenly he came to the realization that this is the truth. That Jesus Christ really is the Son of God. That He is the way and the truth and the life. And that there's salvation in no one else. That there's no other name given under heaven by which men must be saved. See, God called that young man to faith through a book. And then God brought him to Concordia Seminary to study to be a pastor so that he could teach and equip others to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a true story. In fact, if my math is correct, he's been doing exactly that as a pastor for about six years now. God invites. And we're in the flock because we have heard Jesus' voice. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. And they follow me. And our position is sure and certain. Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. But then what? I mean, once the Holy Spirit has brought us into this flock, then what? Well, That's where I think that reading from Acts chapter 20 is especially helpful. You know, the one where Paul gives a recap of his ministry in Ephesus? Because Paul makes two very important points. First, he makes it clear that the real shepherd of the church, of any church, Christian church, is not the pastor. It's Christ himself. I mean, we serve as under-shepherds, but our work is always subject to the Word of God. And by that, I mean the Bible, yeah, but I also mean Jesus. Our task as pastors, like Paul's, is to not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. To be steadfast in standing for what is right, and to liberally testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Our goal is to make disciples by baptizing and teaching just like Christ told us to do in the Great Commission. We want others to follow Jesus and we should be rightly concerned about anyone who, as Paul says, speaks twisted things to draw the disciples after themselves. In 1 Corinthians, Paul addresses that problem head on. One person in the church was saying, I follow Paul. Another one was saying, I follow Apollos. Or I follow Cephas. Wrong. We preach Christ crucified. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. It's not Eric Longman who is our good shepherd. It's not Gordon Basil. It's not... Hubert Bernthal, it's not Eugene Pennekamp, it's not even our newly called pastor, Lee Hope. It's Christ, and Christ alone. And it is Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd, who enables us to will and to do the things that we otherwise could not, to reach out and to help the last and the least, to care for and to pray for one another to encourage our young people as they prepare to attend the National Youth Gathering, to provide a Parents' Day Out program for the parents in our community, 
to be generous with our financial gifts and our time, to build bunk beds for kids who are sleeping on the floor, to hand out food and to provide assistance with bills for those who are down on their luck. It's through Christ that we're enabled to share our faith. It's the Holy Spirit who gives you the words to speak, to share these incredible gifts that you have received from God. And the message in all of this is simple. Remember that God has invited you to follow Jesus Christ. And that he enables us to care for one another. And in the remembering, he enables us to live out that second part of the Great Commission. The part where Jesus' disciples observe all that he has commanded them. I guess you could say that the message boils down to just two simple things. Love God. And love your neighbor. And that may seem challenging until you realize that the power to do both is a gift from God. And so may we always hear the voice and the words of our good shepherd and respond in love according to his good and gracious will. In Jesus' name, amen. You may remain seated. We're going to turn to the Lord in prayer. Before we do, though, just one quick announcement. Uh, you may have seen this in the e-blast that went out. Um, our brother in Christ, Herb Bernthal, passed away uh, yesterday morning. Um, 95 years old. Uh, he was, as some of you know, struggling with dementia for a while. He uh, took a, a spill on Easter Sunday, and apparently that kind of F, um, sped up his dementia. Uh, he was at home, peaceful, with his family around him. We do not have funeral plans yet, um, but keep your eyes out. We will post that on Facebook and send an email out uh, when those get firmed up. We keep Shirley and the whole family in our prayers. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, in your name, your Son purchased us with his own most holy blood. And he now leads us through the gate of death to our eternal home with you. As the sheep of his fold, inspire us to hear his voice gladly and to follow him steadfastly through every tribulation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, shepherd of souls, your servant Paul entrusted his flock to the care of faithful men, urging them to follow him in the way of Christ. Bless your church throughout all the world under the care of her pastors, and instill in them all wisdom, fortitude, humility, and grace. We especially remember and pray for our brothers and sisters at Bella Vista Lutheran Church. We lift up their pastors, Paul Haas and Christopher Gorshi. Here at Holy Trinity, we give thanks for all the volunteers who help make worship run smoothly each week. Readers, ushers, elders, media techs, live stream techs, musicians, altar guilds, safety team members, and more. We pray for your blessings on each of them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, you have provided us with the gift of family. Bless those who have shown us a mother's love and nurtured our lives from childhood. Bless and protect all mothers with child, all those who have suffered a miscarriage or the death of a child, and all those who have yearned for a child and lived with the pain of this unfulfilled longing. We especially lift up pregnant mothers, Emily, Laura, Adrienne, Jay, Rachel, and Tishana. And we give you thanks and praise for the birth of John Thomas to Lauren and Zach on Tuesday. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, we pray your blessings on all who celebrate birthdays this week. Tabby, Cameron, Brett, Millie, Christian, Jack, H.T., and Kyla. We celebrate as well with Steve and Kathy as they mark an anniversary. And we ask your special comfort and blessings for Ione as she marks the first wedding anniversary without Omar by her side. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Compassionate Lord, you will not allow any power or enemy to triumph over your saving purpose or to snatch your lambs from your hand. Give us wise and faithful leaders who will govern in our land according to your law and who will defend the lives of the unborn, the orphaned, the widowed, and the aged. Bless all those who make, administer, and judge our laws, that they may not hinder your purpose. Lord, in your mercy, 
Hear our prayer. Gracious God, you have not forgotten us in our afflictions or abandoned us in our weakness. Deliver the sick and suffering according to your will and give your comfort to the dying. We pray for those with upcoming surgeries. Betty, who will have surgery to place a stent in her heart this week. Karen's friend, Shirley, who has some kind of growth on her kidney and will undergo surgery soon. And Krista, who will undergo knee replacement surgery on June 1st. We pray for Jan and James' son, Kurt, as he's recovering from surgery to repair a torn tendon in his foot. We give you thanks and praise that Christopher's friend, Adiel, has been released from the hospital and is recovering well from multiple strokes. We pray for all who are in need of your healing touch. In all trials and tribulations, Lord God, guard us against despair and grant us patience in the days of our trouble as we await your perfect healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal Lord, by your grace, bless all who receive our Lord's body and blood as they receive the body and blood given into death and raised again for their justification. Grant them the joy of the forgiveness of sins and the power of an endless life. Help them by the sacrament to live out their baptismal life, dying in repentance and being raised in the faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, enthroned in heaven, you gather your saints into the shelter of your presence, making them white in the blood of the Lamb. Give comfort and peace to all who grieve the deaths of loved ones, especially Shirley on the death of her husband, Herb, and Skip on the death of his mother. We lift up Skip's brother, Mark, and his sister, Carol, and we ask a special measure of comfort for them as they had been the primary caretakers to their mother. We pray for Walt and for his family on the death of his father, Walter. Keep us faithful throughout our lives here and bring us through death to join your saints in the ceaseless praises of heaven. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, since you have wakened from death the shepherd of your sheep, grant us your Holy Spirit, that when we hear the voice of our shepherd, we may know him who calls us each by name, and follow where he leads. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Blessed Lord, you've caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Together we join in the morning prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. We rise for the New Testament canticle. <laughs> has been raised from the dead. to sin one. 
once for all, living he lives to God. Count yourselves as dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Christ has been raised from the dead. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God, the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bless and preserve you. Amen. We conclude this portion of our worship with hymn 594, God's Own Child, I Gladly Say It.
You may be seated for a few announcements. As you know, hopefully, we extended a call last week to Pastor Lee Hope to serve as our new Associate Pastor of Youth and Families. I've been talking with Pastor Hope this week. He will be joining us for a visit next weekend. The elders and I are working on an agenda. We want to make sure that Pastor Hope has opportunities to meet as many people as possible and to ask questions to help him as he discerns whether this is where God is leading him to serve. For sure, he will be joining us for worship, and you'll have an opportunity to interact with him during the 9.30 hour next week. One thing to be aware of. Turns out that Pastor Hope has received another call the week before ours, which means that he's actually holding three calls, three paths that are before him, and he's got to discern between them. The first one is at his current congregation, Trinity Pines. The second one is at Trinity Lutheran Church in Columbia, Tennessee. And the third one is here at Holy Trinity. All we know for sure is he's going to wind up at a Trinity somewhere. But please keep Pastor Hope in your prayers along with our brothers and sisters at Trinity Klein and also at Trinity in Columbia. Uh, it's time once again for our annual baby bottle drive. Uh, this is a fundraiser for the, the Benefits Loving Choices, which is a pregnancy resource center here in Rogers. Um, you can grab a bottle in the narthex. I think they're set up out there for you. Um, take that home, fill it up with spare change or bills or checks or $100 bills, whatever you want to put in it. Um, but all of that money goes to Benefit Loving Choices. Um, however you do it, bring it back by Father's Day, which is June 19th. You have probably noticed that abortion and life issues have been in the news a lot lately. This is an opportunity to support a group that does terrific work in guiding mothers toward life-affirming decisions. Lutheran Night at the Ballpark is coming. That's going to be June 14th, 7.05 p.m. The NWA Naturals take on the Arkansas Travelers. Um, so we'll provide the tickets. All you need to do is uh, scrounge up a little bit of money because um, it's dollar brat night that night, so you might want to buy a brat. Uh, but we'll pick up the tab for the tickets. There's a sign-up sheet on the outreach board out in the Narthex. Just sign up to let us know that you're coming. Um, or you can reach out to Lee Landauer if you have any questions about that. I think that's all we have for announcements. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.